So, um, as Heidi said, well, first of all, it's great to be here today. Great to see so many of you here. I've never seen such an attentive group three minutes before a class starts. <laughs> so I certainly wasn't quite like that in college. Um, you know, as, as Heidi said, and you probably know, that the mission of our foundation, a belief, a deep-seated belief that Bill and I share in common, is that all lives have equal value. And when we say all lives, we mean all lives. Because it doesn't matter whether they lived in Boston or Bangladesh or Burundi. We think that all lives have value. But we don't think that everybody has the same chance to grow up and live a healthy life. And yet we think they ought to have that. And we think there's something that our foundation can do about that in partnership with a whole host of partners around the world. So when I talk today about the foundation, I want you to know that there's not a single thing that we do that is not in partnership with others. So when I say we, I don't just mean the foundation. I mean with everybody that helps us carry out this work. So you know what the mission is of the foundation. All lives have equal value. And you may know a little bit about the what and how that plays out. And I'm going to get more to the what. But I want to give you a little bit more of a personal view about how I think about the foundation. Because I'm guessing that all of you have read a a little bit of something about my husband. (laughs) And maybe even a little bit about how he ran Microsoft or maybe a little bit about how he thinks about the foundation. But we are very much co-chairs and co-equals in running the foundation. And that's a really important premise for the two of us. This is our life's work going forward. And so I need to take you back in time a little bit, maybe with a couple of stories, so that you can understand a little bit about how I think and how we think together. And then I really want to talk about innovation, because we believe that it's true innovation that really is going to help lift people up all over the planet. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is and and how that plays itself out. So just to take you back a little bit in time, um, when Bill and I were first dating, which was very briefly after I was at Microsoft in 1987, um, you know, we were in that getting to know one another phase, right? And so when you're getting to know one another phase, you're trying a lot of new things together. And I was at the store late one night, I think it was at the drugstore, picking up some stuff, and I happened to go by the aisle where there were puzzles. And I thought, hey, this is something my family's always enjoyed doing, which are puzzles. Maybe, you know, I don't really know if Bill likes puzzles, but I'll take one home and see what he thinks, right? So I pick up a 1,200-piece puzzle, one of those little, you know, little cheap cardboard ones, you know, it's rectangular, et cetera, and it was the Eiffel Tower. And with a beautiful sky behind it, blue sky, very few clouds. So Eiffel Tower, blue sky, 1,200 pieces. And I take it home, and um, I take it to Bill's house, and my family, whenever we used to do puzzles when I was growing up, we would dump them out on the dining room table, and over a series of a whole host of weeks and months, you know, you'd come by, and you'd put five or six pieces in, and then you'd come by and put a few more pieces in, and maybe in a couple months go by, and it's all done. Well, I came home, and Bill was, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll do a puzzle. I love to do puzzles. I said, okay, great. We, We crack open the cardboard box Thursday night. We throw it open on his dining room table. And one thing I didn't quite understand about Bill at that time was that, by gosh, when you sit down to do something, you are going to finish it, and you're going to finish it then. (laughs) 1,200 pieces, the Eiffel Tower, that's not doable in a few hours, okay? And I'm I'm pretty good at puzzles. (laughs) It turns out so is Bill. We've actually had a few puzzle competitions just for fun of like equal puzzles of same number of pieces. But um, that's another story. But anyway, so we dump this puzzle out and we get going and hours and hours go by and I'm exhausted. I'm like, okay, <laughs> give it up. And we're going away for the weekend actually do something fun with this family. And uh, you know, there's just no way we can keep working on this thing because it's on the dining room table. So we go away for the weekend, we come back. Well, another story which I won't go into, but we were, had a little competition going on Um, that weekend, too, on a Northwest game called Pickleball, and I dislocated my shoulder. I was with him. I was on his team. So we come back at the end of the weekend. I'm, you know, I'm hobbling like this with my, can hardly move my hand because it's dislocated shoulders in a sling, and we come back to the puzzle, and we are going to do this puzzle. And what I learned from that is, A, we both like puzzles, and we like them because they're challenging, and they're interesting, and there's some similarities about what we both like about puzzles. But if we're going to do a puzzle together, we now do ones that are 600 pieces because you can do a 600-piece puzzle in one sitting. And today we do puzzles that are 
We don't have a picture for. That's our favorite. They're often wooden. If you're doing a picture that's, say, of Napa Valley, completely irregular shaped edge, there might be a whole vine that goes around it and you don't know it. There might be pieces where there's straight edges in the middle of the pieces, pieces where the puzzler has left holes in it. Um, we love those puzzles. And that's a good metaphor for me about how we work together and how I think about problems, which is with a puzzle, you always know that there's an end solution, that the person who created one of these jigsaw puzzles has an end, end thing in mind, and you're going to get there. But along the way, you're going to experience a lot of frustration. You're going to have to look at things from different points of view. So sometimes Bill's working on shapes and I'm working on colors. Sometimes we switch. Sometimes we'll notice something the other person doesn't notice. Sometimes you'll have a different perspective. Sometimes you'll step away for a while to get a different perspective, and you'll come back a few minutes later. But you have to trust yourself when you're doing a puzzle that you're going to get there. And you have to push through the frustration. And to me, that's part of the fun. So to take you back, and this will get to the foundation, because this has a lot to do with how we think about things at the foundation. But before I go there, I want to take you back even a little bit further in my history, which is I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I'm one of four children. Uh, my parents, Ray and Elaine French, we grew up in Dallas. My dad was uh, a mechanical engineer. He went to Georgia Tech, came to Stanford for his graduate work in mechanical engineering. My mother did not go to college. Her parents didn't believe in her going to college, so they put her in the workforce right after high school. She always wished she'd gotten a college degree. So when I was growing up, it was deeply embedded in, in, the four, in my three siblings and I that we were going to college, going to college. And my parents, that was not going to be easy on an engineer's salary to put four children through college. And they were determined that we could go anywhere in the country that we could get into and that they were going to pay for it. We weren't going to go on financial aid or scholarships. So my parents set up a family business. They, we, they bought and rented out properties and then would sell some of them as the market increased. And as a, as a young student in high school, I mowed lawns at these rental properties. I painted. I cleaned up after people left, so I learned what it was like to work hard. But my parents also invested early in a computer. They bought one of the Apple Threes that were sold. There were only about 2,000 of them ever sold. We owned one. They still own it. It's in the closet somewhere. And my sister and I kept the books, and we learned what was then the spreadsheeting program, VisiCalc. I learned that thing inside and out. I could program the cells. I got interested in computers, and I understood the flows of money. So my parents also put us in high school. My sister and I, there's a big gap, two girls and then two boys. They put us in high school in Dallas, Texas, a Catholic high school, all girls Catholic high school. It wasn't the best high school in the city. And that was a little bit frustrating to me, so I knew I had to work really hard at this high school to get noticed by any college. But along the way, I met a math teacher. She was getting her Ph.D. at night in computer science, single mom, raising three boys. And she saw that I was good in math, and she said, I'm going to make sure you always know you're good at math. And she helped guide my career through the hardest math subjects in high school. In my junior year of high school, she bought 10 computers, Apple IIs. She went to the head nun of the school and said, I want to get these Apple IIs. I want you to invest in them. She convinced the, the uh, nun to invest in them. And we had 10 Apple IIs. And what she let us girls do was to get out ahead of her in computer programming. She taught us what she knew, and she let us run wild. That then turned into a summer job for me, where I was teaching kids both math, tutoring them, and how to program. And it led ultimately to a computer science degree at, at uh, Duke, and ultimately to a career at Microsoft. And I tell you that because when you get into computer science, for those of you who have done it, and in engineering, as you know, it's a lot like a puzzle, except that there's not often a closed-end solution. There might be somewhere you're trying to go, but there are many possibilities to get there. And you have to have a lot of creativity, and you've got to go through a lot of frustration, and you've got to keep your curiosity up, and you've got to believe in yourself when you're programming. And I went through college when there were very few women in computer science. After freshman year, basically none. I programmed with guys all through, all through Duke, and I learned how to be good at managing teams. So when I got to Microsoft, I had to make sure that I remembered those skills. When things were tough for me at Microsoft, I loved it there. I worked there for nine years. 
But when I would get unhappy a little bit because I would think, gosh, I have to be like somebody else. I have to manage like that person manages that team. I had to realize, no, I had to go back to who I was and manage in my style from what I'd learned in college about forming teams and moving forward. So for me, puzzles and getting into something that's pretty unknown is something that gives me a lot of discomfort, but is also something that I realize you've got to work through, and at the end, you can come up with unbelievably elegant solutions if you bring the right team together and you guide them in the right way. So now, Bill and I are involved in this foundation, <laughs> this very large foundation. And everything we do at the foundation, it may look to people like it's a large foundation. In terms of resources, it is the largest foundation. But in terms of the problems that we are trying to tackle in the world, we are absolutely tiny because we are going after 27 different and distinct strategies around problems around the world. So whether that's malaria, trying to eradicate malaria, whether that's trying to find an AIDS vaccine, which is something we're deeply involved in, whether it's trying to wipe polio off the face of the planet, and we're in the last mile of that, whether it's getting contraceptives to women or vaccines to children or trying to fix the US education system. You want to talk about an enormous problem. We are a tiny little piece of that puzzle. But we believe that if we can bring the right innovations and the right things to life and get the right partners together focused on these goals, that some of these goals we will get in our lifetimes. And we think that that can change things for a whole host of people around the world. So what I thought I would do is take you through basically two very large areas of the foundation. As I said, there are 27 different areas that we're involved in. But I thought I'd take you through two to give you an example of innovation and also a little bit about how we think about or I think about the problems. The first one is, when Bill and I first got in this work, we got really puzzled by this notion that so many children were dying a year. We looked at basically deaths around the world, adult deaths and children's deaths. And to us, when we read a New York Times article and then went and got the backup data and we learned that children in the developing world were dying of diarrhea, we, we scratched our head. We said, are you kidding me? You know, almost two million children a year die of diarrhea? When in our day and age you go down to the drugstore and, and there's a solution for it, that, that just shouldn't be. And why is that? And we started to learn from experts and take apart the problem. And we started to learn that millions of children were dying from a whole series of things. Children, when you look at childhood deaths, you measure childhood deaths under the age of five years. And there were two things that befuddled us, really. One was, why is it that this innovation, this amazing innovation of biology that we have in the United States, and we take so for granted, or in the UK or in Japan, that a vaccine that you, know, you, you grew up and got as children, why does it take 15 to 20 years for that to get to the developing world? Why is that? And, and, and sh that shouldn't be. What, what is it about the system that makes that happen? And we said, as we started to learn about it, we said, we can do something about that. That lag should not be 15 to 20 years. It should be a year, basically, or less. There's just no reason. And the second thing is, we started to say, some of these huge childhood deaths that are going are because we have vaccines that don't get out to the developing world, we have solutions, but others are like rotavirus, a huge diarrheal disease. We don't get it essentially here in the United States, or you don't die of it in the United States if you're a child. Let me say that. You get it, but you don't die of it. So there were market failures why a vaccine, there was no rich world market for a diarrheal vaccine or a pneumonia vaccine. And again, we thought we could stimulate the pharmaceutical companies through public-private partnership to start to create vaccines. If we could guarantee them a market of millions of children getting this vaccine and, and then being paid for it in the developing world, but paid just a little bit over cost, but millions of doses, if we could commit to a market and we knew that the demand would be there, we could incent them with the right research dollars to actually create those vaccines. And that is, in fact, what has happened. There is now a rotavirus vaccine on the market, and there's now a new pneumococcus vaccine. <laughs> I was in Kenya over a year ago, and it was less than a year from when the new pneumococcus vaccine came out, and it was being rolled out in Kenya with the right strains from Kenya. And what that means is that when I was growing up in the early 1960s, 
20 million children died every single year. So when you look at all the children that are born in the world, 20 million die. Now, the majority of those deaths happen, of course, in the developing world. And Bill and I said, well, that shouldn't be. But the way we track whether we're making progress is, are those childhood deaths coming down? And I'm happy to tell you that last year there were less than 7 million childhood deaths because of that innovation of vaccine being taken to the developing world. So that's a big scale problem. When I try to explain to you, if I tried, which I won't, to explain to you, you know, why is it, how hard is it for Kenya to get the vaccine out to the most remote areas? What does it take in terms of keeping a vaccine cold in Rwanda? It is incredibly complicated, but a system is set up that can work. But I want to talk to you and challenge you about innovation and challenge your minds to think about a slightly different kind of innovation as well. So when I talk about these childhood deaths under five years old, 20 million back in 1960, we're now down to 7 million uh, for children under the age of five years. One of the things we didn't do as a world was take the problem apart further until about 2004. And in 2004, we started to look, and I say we, I mean the global community, we started to look at those childhood deaths and realize we were only going to get the deaths, this, what we're down to, the 7 million deaths, from 30 days to 5 years of life, you can get a lot of those deaths with vaccines. But guess what? 40% of those 7 million deaths happen in the first 30 days of life. And a vaccine isn't going to make a hill of beans worth of difference for a neonate, for a newborn, uh, not a neonate, a newborn. So what will solve the first 30 days? We have to look at what those children are dying of in the first 30 days. And that innovation has nothing to do with technology. That innovation is something I'm very, very excited about, which is behavior change. So let me give you a concrete example. There's an amazing researcher working in northern India where a lot of these deaths happen. He happens to be from Johns Hopkins. His name is Vishwajit. And what he has learned is that if you teach women essentially four things to do when their baby is born, if you understand where they're coming from culturally and understand why they do, they have very good reasons for believing certain things and doing what they do. But if you can help them culturally understand how to change those practices and them to spread the practices in a culturally acceptable way, you, he has proven through great research that you can bring down those deaths by over half just in 18 months. So what, is, what do you have to learn? We have to learn why the women do it. In these northern remote villages in India, a lot of times the babies are born, and who's called in to attend the birth? Well, the mother-in-law's there because she's part of the power structure. She's the one that usually controls the, the daughter-in-law. The lowest caste member is brought in to attend the birth because this is considered a very dirty event when a baby's born in their culture because there's a lot of blood. There's a lot of placental fluid that comes out. And what happens is that lowest caste member comes in, the baby's born, they put the baby down in the dirt, and they tend to the mother because they're so afraid. They've seen so much maternal death they're so afraid the mother's going to die, they tend to her first. And so they put the baby aside, and they let the baby get cold. By the time they come back to the baby, the baby's cold, and then the lowest caste member, her job is to scrub that baby with a gritty, sandy paste that she makes up, made of usually the soil, and hand the baby back to the mother-in-law. And unless every piece of vernix is off of that newborn baby, she hasn't done her job, and she is not paid by the mother-in-law. So what we have to teach women is that the culturally appropriate thing to do is we ask them, when you come out of the river and you've bathed, how do you feel? And they say, cool, my skin feels cool. What do you do? You put your sari on. We say, when the baby's born, you can tend to the mother, but put the baby on the mother's chest, wrap the sari around the baby and the mother, and that kangaroo care that we've also now learned works in the United States, we've engineered backwards, that will keep the baby's heart rate going. It'll keep the baby warm. The mother's milk will start to flow. Immediate and exclusive breastfeeding is the right thing to do so the baby doesn't get diarrhea, isn't fed dirty water, which often happens. Keeping the baby warm, teaching them to clean the baby with something else other than gritty, sandy paste. And they were putting an emollient on the baby, a mustard seed oil. They've done it for centuries. It grows in their village. 
And when we were able to realize that if they put sunflower seed, they still want to put an emollient on the baby, there's good reason for that, but teach them that something else that grows, like sunflower seed oil, is actually good for the baby, if they do those four things, they will save half the baby's lives. And when you go and talk to the villagers in these villages where they've run these pieces of research and the villagers see the change, and you sit with a group like this, I've sat under the trees with a group of about 200 men and women, and you say, what changes have you noticed in the village? And they start talking and talking, and you'll say, you'll ask them, how many of you have, had, have seen a baby's death in your lifetime? So many hands go up. How many of you have seen a baby's death in the last two year, three years? Still a lot of hands go up. How many of you have seen a baby's death in the last year? There are so few hands because half their children that are born are living now. That social and cultural change, when you talk to the women and you say to the Indian women, how do you spread this? They say, we'll spread it. And you say to them, how will you do it? Well, they have all these social networks. Like we have social networks on the computer. They have unbelievable social networks. They go back home often to their own village to birth. They said, we'll tell our sisters, we'll tell our mothers, we'll try to get the news to our mother-in-laws. They will spread these cultural practices if you get the mother-in-laws sold in too, to part of it, all the power structures around them, and if they can tell the stories in their own way, and they come up with an amazing way to tell these stories in their own culture that spread the news about using sunflower seed oil or immediately exclusively breastfeeding. Those practices we know are going to be the way to tackle this global problem of these 40% of the deaths in the, first, uh, in the first 30 days of life. So to me, those are innovations. They're a different kind of innovation because we have to think very differently about what will save children's <laughs> lives and how you create social and behavioral change. We know from centuries and centuries about how cultures change, that it's doable, but those practices have to be spread and spread in a culturally appropriate way. So I'm going to shift for a minute. And there are, we have, I have lots of examples of innovation from the foundation. But rather than taking you through another one, I thought I would shift for just one more um, section and talk about family planning and how I got into the work of contraceptives. Um, Again, when Bill and I started the foundation and decided we were going to get involved in global health, we were primarily interested in two things, vaccines, which I just talked about, and also uh, population. Why were, there, why were there so many children being born on the planet? We started down that path on both vaccines and population, and we decided to really push forward on vaccines. And then we got involved in malaria and HIV and a whole host of other adult issues. But we've always had this other issue on, on the back burner. For some internal reasons, we didn't push forward on it. But once we felt in the last few years that we had the right team, and the more and more I traveled, I would be out. For the last 15 years, I've been traveling on behalf of the foundation. I go, I go everywhere. I go to really, really remote villages in India. Remote. I go to the slums in Bangladesh. I go to the slums of Nairobi. I've been to probably two dozen African countries. And I always try to sit down and talk to the women. You learn so much talking to the men and the women together, but also the women in separate groups will tell you a lot. And I sit down on a mat with them often, me on one side and them on another, and I always try to put myself in their shoes. And I just go in as a Western woman in a pair of khakis and a t-shirt. They don't know who I am. I'm just a Western woman who's there to learn and help. And when you talk to the women, and I would be trying to talk to them about childhood vaccines and what they know, which is a lot, and the distance they'll go to get one, they kept saying to me, but what about that shot? What about that shot I used to get? How come when I go to the clinic now, it's not available? I have to go four times a year every three months to get it. It's a, they get an um, injectable shot. They said, I go to great lengths. I hide it from my husband. I have to take a day off from my farm. I take my new baby with me. But they say, I go to the clinic, and I may walk for miles and get there, and it's not there. And now, look how many children I have. And I was blown away by the places I was that the women kept asking me about this injectable, because they consider it's a shot, just like we give them childhood vaccines, shots for their children. And so as I started to learn more, and learn that there are 215 million women who would like to have access to contraceptives who don't today. 
And I started to think about you know, what that means for women, the number of pregnancies that happen that women don't want to have, and they will tell you they don't want to have them. They can't. When you talk to women in the developing world and men, their goal, but particularly women, is to educate their children, to be able to let their children grow up healthy, to be able to feed them so they can put them in school. They're all about the next generation. But they will tell you in many, many countries, if I have too many children, there's no way I can feed them. So as I started to learn more about this, I kept saying to myself, but why? Why is this not on the global health agenda? What is it about the history of contraceptives? When you just take the US alone, and you think about the difference that contraceptives make for women here. And when I say contracept contraceptives, I want to be really clear here. As I said, I'm Catholic. I grew up Catholic. I'm a practicing Catholic. I am not talking about abortion. I'm talking about contraceptives, the things we go down to the drugstore to get, or we talk to our doctors and we get, the things we use, the tools in the US. But why is it that 215 million women are telling us they want access when you interview them and they can't get it? That, that just shouldn't be, and it makes such a huge difference in their lives. So I set out on a learning journey, again, kind of like this puzzle analogy that I used at the beginning, and I was pretty frustrated because I felt like, gosh, I'll, I'll never know enough, and I, but I kept thinking, somebody has to speak out, and I kept looking for the person who would speak out on this topic. I kept thinking, that person will do it, or this person will do it, and I realized at some point there wasn't somebody and that that had to be the voice of our foundation and specifically probably me because it's a women's issue. So I went back and I learned the history. I learned what had happened to take it off the global health agenda. What was the ugly history of coercion in my own, our own country in Mississippi, down in Mississippi? What happened in Peru? What happened in India? What happened under the LBJ administration here? What happened when UNFPA was set up? Why is it that certain religious groups are in favor and others are not? Why is it that it's so controversial in our country that we can't even discuss it? I mean, we can't even have a logical conversation, not about abortion, but about contraceptives. And so I decided that this was going to be one of the goals of my life's work. And so with DFID, which is the development agency in the UK, we decided that we would put it back on the global health agenda. And we set out to raise $2.3 billion to buy access, voluntary access, to contraceptives for women, with the goal being to get 120 million new women on contraceptives, if they chose, by 2020. And I can tell you that this journey was not easy. I can tell you that the London Family Planning Summit, where we announced this in July, in March, we didn't have the money. In May, we still didn't have the money. When we got on stage, we were still counting the pledges leading up to it. When we got up on stage, we were able to announce that we'd raised $2.6 billion for contraceptives. This is squarely back on the agenda. And I feel so strongly that we need to get this out for women. And it will change their lives. We can avert 30 million abortions. Women don't want to have an abortion. But you put them in that situation if they can't have a contraceptive. We can avert 3 million children dying children that were part of unintended pregnancies. We can avert 200,000 women and girls dying in childbirth every year. We would cut the maternal mortality around the world by two-fifths if we just get contraceptives out, just the contraceptives by 2020 that I'm talking about. So we have 69 nations, developed and developing world, who've come together. The developing world, they're putting their national plans together. They're rolling out their own plans. We're supporting that with money. And as well, we're supporting it with new research and new technologies. We're not investing in new contraceptives. But guess what? There are some exciting things that you can do in contraceptives long term to make them longer acting so a woman doesn't have to go in the clinic every three months to get a shot so that she could have something that is much more readily available in her village and lasts a whole lot longer. So as Heidi said, that will be my life's work. And I have to tell you, it's been quite a learning journey for me with a whole host of experts to figure out what's even possible in that area. And I'm glad to take more questions on that uh, if that's of interest. So let me just say this in closing. Um, one very brief story, which is um, when our first uh, daughter was born, Jen, uh, when she was really young and she was learning to tie her shoes. And you know, when you're learning to tie your shoes, you probably remember you're not that dexterous. You're trying to figure it out and it's tough. And Bill and I passed by her room, and she was in there struggling, trying to learn to tie her shoes. And she was so frustrated with herself. And I kept hearing her and go, ugh, ugh. 
And then we passed by her room a few minutes later, and she was kind of getting the first loop done, and she said to herself, this is difficult. <laughs> she said, but I like difficult. <laughs> and I would suggest to you that there's not a person in this room that doesn't like difficult. You don't come to Stanford if you don't like difficult. <laughs> Let's be honest here. And so I'll leave you just with the three quick thoughts, which is you're at an amazing moment in time to be here. And figure out where your passion is and pursue it. Pursue it with a vengeance. Surround yourself with experts. There are so many unbelievable experts on this campus. I mean, this is just, it's, a, it's an unbelievable place. So gather experts around you in fields you're uncomfortable in, things that you don't know anything about and that aren't in your major, and see where you can go. And do something now. Because I'll tell you, it does get trickier if you decide to have a family later to balance the work and the, and the family life. There's a time to always come back to it. But do it now. I guarantee you, if you believe in innovation, there are things you can do to change the world. So I'll leave you with my favorite quote, which was something I learned early in philanthropy from Margaret Mead, a former anthropologist. And she said, never underestimate the ability of a group of committed individuals to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. So with that, I will take questions. Thank you. Do you want me to pick them for you, or do you want to pick? Sure. It's up to you. Either way. Questions? Sure, over there. Marinda, I, uh, so uh, I'm really impressed by the work by the Gates Foundation, and I've spent a summer with Peter Diamandis, uh, like learning how how incentive prizes work for uh, a lot of new areas of, of fixing these global issues. So, have you ever thought of uh, uh, coming up with this idea of philanthropy 2.0, where you're trying to set up incentive prizes to drive innovation to solve those big challenges? So, so I'm going to repeat yeah, the please questions do. because uh, for the for the thing. So the, the question is around incentive competitions in order to foster further philanthropy. So one of the things um, that we've been quite involved in is something called, that we set up called the Grand Challenges. And what these are are prizes for uh, particularly faculty members and students who are young in their careers, who have innovative ideas, but that their idea might not get to light without some initial funding. When we first got into setting up, and these are, so we set out a series of grand challenges in health, these big, large-scale problems that we thought needed to be solved. And then if you said, hey, I have a great idea about how to fortify a food, let's say, a, a food that a lot of people eat in the developing world that hasn't been done before, or against this set of grand challenges, you could apply for a grant, and through a pretty, we tried to keep the process pretty light, you could get a first round of funding. Then if, we, if your idea as you went along looked promising based on the funding we'd given you and you come back again and you're able to prove that you've gotten to a certain point, we would, we would crop, cream that group down to a smaller group and then we would give a second round of funding. And what we've learned from that is that we were giving too large of grants initially. And what we were getting were people who would have gotten grants anyway, potentially from the NIH or others. So we've actually learned to make those grants even a little bit smaller so that the first round of funding is a smaller amount of money we're getting so many more ideas, and we've planted this program not just in the U.S. now, but in China and in India and places in Africa. So what we're doing is bringing ideas out of the lab and trying to bring them forward against these enormous global health pro uh, projects. And then, if you, again, if you make it through the first round of funding and your idea proves out over, say, 18 months, then you can come back for another round of funding that's larger than the first one. So we do have, that's just one example of an incentive prize that we have. Why don't you pick? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just want to, I want to know more about the motivations for the foundation. Like, where does that come from? A lot of people have done computer science. A lot of people have done coding. A lot of people have done <laughs> jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> but where do you go? How do you go from that to every life uh, has equal value? I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thing, but I can't see that coming from jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. So the question yeah. is, what was the motivation and is the motivation for the foundation? Yeah, um... So I guess one other piece of little history you have to understand about both, and me, both Bill and me is we both come from families that believe in volunteerism 
and embedded that in us very early on. Bill's parents were incredibly involved in civic philanthropy in Seattle, and his mom sat on the Little United Way board. So around the dinner table, they talked a lot about philanthropy and what was possible. And in my family, we believed in volunteerism. In fact, the model, of the um, motto of the school I went to, this all-girls Catholic school, was serviam, which means to serve. And so I served in the local hospital. I served in the Dallas County Courthouse. I served in the local public school that was two miles down the road from my school. You want to talk about a different school than mine? All you had to do was go two miles down the road. And I helped tutor in the back of the classroom. So Bill and I both um, came with those beliefs. And literally, during the time we were engaged, we decided that the, basically the vast majority of resources from Microsoft would go back to society. It was just... It's hard to describe that that was just so natural for us, and it seemed like the right. It just seemed like the right thing to do because we both had this belief that, you know, Bill couldn't have done what he did, except in a country that had some of the benefits that he had here: the great schooling, the great infrastructure that exists, et cetera. I mean, as Warren Buffett will often tell you, you know, his investment skills wouldn't work very well on a farm in Kenya, right? So you know, we have benefited enormously from living in the United States. And so that just, it was the natural for us. And the question so was not if for us then, it was when. And Bill always thought it would be in his 60s. That's what he always said. Uh, you know, and he would say his mom would actually kind of bug him about this when he was still early in his career. Even when we were dating, we'd go to dinner at his parents' house on Sunday night, and his mom would kind of say, why don't you be more involved in the United Way? He was involved a little bit. And he'd say, oh, mom, don't bother me. I'm busy with Microsoft. I'll do it when I'm 60. I'm in my 60s. But as we got going, after, um, after Jen was born and I stopped working at Microsoft, um, we, just, we started to learn more. I was getting more time to travel and learn. I was seeing things in the field, coming home and talking about them. Bill would get jazzed and read these big development reports and get the data behind kind of what I was seeing, right, which is fantastic. And we were learning together. And it just made sense to get going. And so we'd gotten going in a very small, small way, uh, right after we were married, but we were getting inundated with all these letters and things that you feel just, I mean, it's heartbreaking stuff. You know, a child that needs a liver transplant in the United States, somebody dying of cancer. But we started to realize very quickly that if we didn't focus on something, we wouldn't have impact with this money, that you could give it away in all these little areas and they might be meaningful, but you had to have a focus and you had to have a bullseye and then things would fall away and it would feel okay not giving a child here that needs a liver a liver because you're saving a child of, from malaria in the developing world. So we just got going and it became more and more and it became more of a learning journey. And it, it was actually quite challenging. When Bill was working at Microsoft, um, he, he absolutely loved his job. But as you can imagine, when we're going through, you know, he's the CEO of the company, we're going through the DOJ trial, and we've got a foundation in young kids. It's challenging. And where do you find the time for, you know, okay, we're giving money away, but we're doing it thoughtfully. And so what I would say now, which is just beautiful, and neither of us, you know, neither of us would have known that this would happen, is that, you know, Bill decided, obviously, to, to retire from Microsoft and devote himself, himself full time. And he's obviously not 60 yet, and, um, because he's enjoying it so much. And he realized, I think, also what a huge difference it could make. Um, and one of the nice things was he had always talked about when um, we were dating and also in the early married years that he really loved, he's always loved science and he's always loved innovation. But he always said, you know, I'd love to be around a group of broad scientists. You know, I love the computer stuff, but not just in the computer field. I, you know, he loved biology. He was reading biology books when I was first getting to know him on vacation. And um, he's always loved science. And so now he gets that aspect too. He's got all these scientists who come through the doors of the foundation and who we go out and visit. So... It's honestly been kind of a coming to for us where we had an end goal in mind, but it's more become a learning journey and then it just it builds on itself and next thing you know, this is what we're doing full time. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Bill's one of the greatest entrepreneurs the world has ever seen. Do uh, you think spreading entrepreneurship in the developing world and enabling the poorest of the poor to become successful entrepreneurs is a scalable and, and the quickest way and most viral way to lift people out of poverty? So the question summary is, is there an opportunity to build such a great entrepreneur? Is there such an opportunity to go out and spread entrepreneurship throughout the developing world as a way to lift people out of poverty? There's absolutely that opportunity. And I would say if you have the passion to do that, I think that would be amazing. Um, 
We don't do that only because we, because if you kind of look at, if you think of it from Maslow's um, hierarchy, if people can't be healthy and they don't even have the means to feed their children, it's very hard for them to get an education to then go on to entrepreneurialism. And we believe in that whole virtuous cycle, that if you can get them on the right cycle of health, which is why we do the health stuff, and then you can help them lift themselves out of poverty, get more money off the farm, to then get their, their kids in school, you can start that virtuous cycle that they can lift themselves up. But we feel like you got to, for us anyway, the piece we wanted to tackle was the health and then the agriculture, which is the lifting themselves up to get a little bit more means of income. Um, but yes, I think there's absolutely room for entrepreneurialism. But what we're trying to do is deal with the bottom $2 billion, the, you know, two, less than $2 a day. Uh, but there's absolutely that role. And that's why you're starting to see, certainly, especially in the large cities in Africa, you know, you're seeing more of that. I, I see so much ingenuity. When you go out to India and, and lots of places in Africa, there's so much human potential and ingenuity. And we've just got to unlock it and make it, make it easier for people. How yeah. somebody from the back? Some, yeah. some folks in the back. Any more questions? Way in the back there, yeah. Go ahead. Your reputation is as a very results-oriented, curious learner, hardworking philanthropist. And I want to thank you for that because I think it's elevated what philanthropy can do in this world. Um, my question is about um, teaching quality. So in your U.S. investment, you have a new initiative trying to um, uncover what a quality teacher is and how we can measure it and then reward and incent that kind of quality teaching. I'm just wondering if you could talk about any of the findings from that new initiative. So glad you asked that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, The question being, you've studied a lot about teaching, what makes a great teacher and how one can spread that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so that's been, again, talk about a learning journey for us, Uh, the U.S. education system. Bill and I often say even these enormous bets we've got in things like vaccines and malaria and HIV, our biggest bet and is the U.S. education system, and, and probably the most difficult thing we work on. Um, I think one of the most encouraging things, though, is exactly what you said is great teaching. So I think we all inherently know when we have a great teacher, and you inherently when you put your kid in school, you have a sense of whether that's a great teacher. But what we knew from good research is that a great teacher makes an enormous difference in a student's learning. They can get a year and a half's worth of gains you know, in terms of what the student learns from beginning of academic year to the end. Let's just talk about elementary school and high school for a minute. So I'm talking K through 12. You can get a year and a half gain. But a bad teacher, you're not even going to get a half a year gain for a student. So, you know, so when you stand back from the US education system and you say, OK, a third of the kids drop out before they get to the end of high school, and a third aren't ready for college when they get there. They're going into remedial classes in, in, in um, community college in particular. So we're only, this enormous public education system we have, we're only educating a third of the kids well. There's something broken about the system. And so what we started to realize is that the fix is making sure every student has one of those great teachers, every student. And as you look at the evaluation system across the United States, of teachers, 98.5, I'll be exact, 98.5 were being being rated satisfactory. But if that's true, if 98.5% are satisfactory, then why aren't, you know, 98.5% of our kids ready to go on to college? It just doesn't, the math doesn't work, right? So we started to say to ourselves, but what makes a great teacher? So what research shows there's a great teacher? Well, there wasn't research out there to show what an effective teacher was. So we kept scratching our heads saying, okay, we need effective teachers. We inherently think we know what they feel like, but we can't really quantify it. We don't really know what makes a great teacher. So we got several school districts, 3,000 teachers, to allow us to videotape in their room. And we got to see what great teaching is. And the way we knew we were getting great teaching was they were able to take kids who were below a certain baseline coming in in a year, or either at grade level or below grade level, and get them to the next grade level. They actually, when you tested the kids at the end of the year, they had gotten their year and a half uh, gain of learning. And so you said, this is what great teaching is. And when we started to learn what great teaching is, we said, how do we practice, practice, sorry, how do we spread the practice of great teaching? And it comes down to creating a great evaluation system like a business would do that gives real feedback to teachers that tells them you know, these are some master teachers. Let us have you go see them and see how they're teaching. These are some things you're good at. 
These are some things you need to get better at, but a real evaluation system with real rankings and ratings, not just based on kids' test scores. We have to put a percentage in for kids' test scores, but let peer teachers who are trained come in and evaluate the teaching of those teachers, because now that we know what effective teaching looks like, we know whether we're seeing it in a classroom or not. So train peer teachers to come in and evaluate. Train principals to really come in and evaluate, not come in once a, a year and do a flyby that says, is the classroom organized, you know, a few other random things, and that's it. And student surveys. It turns out that students do know whether they have, have a good teacher. It's not a popularity contest. Do I like my teacher? Do they dress well? It's not that. Does your teacher help you when you're confused? Does the teacher explain concepts to the class? Does the teacher go over the homework problems with you that you miss? Those are about three out of about six questions that are super indicative of whether you actually have an effective teacher. So if you create a real evaluation system with peer evaluation, principal evaluation, coaching and mentoring, some test score data, and student survey data, we can get a real evaluation system that takes the teachers who are B minuses and moves them up to B pluses, and take the Bs and move them up to As, and take the Cs and move them up to Bs. We have a cadre of great teachers, but we don't evaluate and give them mentoring and coaching and feedback and professional development. And that's what we're out to do. And we're on a journey on that through across the United States, and it's tough. <laughs> uh-huh, over here. Um, so you mentioned that one of the problems with contraception is not only accessibility, but acceptance. And um, I was at a talk with Ann and Paul Ehrlich, who work on population growth here at Stanford. And this is what occupies Stanford. Um, and they mentioned that, I can't remember exactly where this was, in a culture where tip women are typically married off, there was an experiment where they started producing radio novellas, uh, taking characters with extremely empowered women and seeing how that could affect um, how men and women perceive themselves in that, in that specific culture. Um, so are you, is the Gates Foundation doing anything to address the social aspect with contraceptives like you did in India with the birthing practices? And I'm not going to answer that because I can tell that you're close enough to the mic. So Okay, good. Go for it. <laughs> um, so uh, let me give you the most concrete example because I think it's super illustrative of your question, which is a great one. Um, so I, right before the London <coughs> Family Summit, Planning Summit this summer, I went to Niger and Senegal. And I went to Niger for a very specific reason. It's the highest fertility rate in the world in terms of number of babies had by women. It's the highest desired fertility rate in the world in terms of how many births men want their wives to have. And the highest desired fertility rate in the world in terms of what women, how many children they say they want to have. So I thought, okay, highest of all these things in the world, super poor country, is this even possible? Is this even remotely possible to bring contraceptives? Because we know in society after society where contraceptives have come, whether you look at France or Germany or the US or Bangladesh, which has an amazing longitudinal study since 1970, that if you get contraceptives to women, it used to be two generations before you saw a sea change in terms of the number of children they have. It's now one generation. And it spreads not on socioeconomic lines, it spreads on cultural lines. So I thought, okay, Niger, can we, can we possibly get at this in Niger? Very polygamous society. So um, I sat down and talked with several women in their homes. I stood by the well. I was, in, I was about an hour and a half outside of Niamey, which is the capital, out in the desert, the absolute desert. And when I was talking to women about contraceptives, I said to this one woman, she had uh, six children, and she was using contraceptives. And I said to her, well, you know, I was saying to her about having so many children, are you going to have more children? She said, absolutely not. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I go to this clinic. And she was, she was angry. She said, why is it the clinic you were just at? I saw you there near my house. I can see it from my house. Why can't I get a contraceptive there? Which I had actually just been haranguing the officials about that too. She said, I have to go essentially seven kilometers and walk in the heat. And last time I went, I couldn't get the shot. She said, can't you see can't you see that we're starving here? She said, we are starving, starving, starving. She said, I can't feed my children, and, and you're not getting me this shot. You're, you're not helping me. And when I said to her, well, okay, you know about contraceptives, and, and there actually were these village women, these healthcare workers who are starting to give contraceptive pills out, um, and they go through the dust, and they hand you a little packet of pills, not in a little plastic case, just you get the pills. 
And, and so I said to her, okay, you know about contraceptives. Do your sister, sisters in the village know about it? And she said, yes. And she said, the good thing about women is we talk. And she said, we talk by the well. We talk when the children are born. And we talk when we grind millet every day. And she said, and she said, so we're talking about contraceptives and more of us are using them. And I said to her, okay, so this is a polygamous society. Her husband's not there. And I said, so what happens if another co-wife comes in? And she got very somber. And she said, well, I just told you I'm not going to have any more children. But she said, if another co-wife comes in, I will have to have more children because it's a race between her and the other wife for who has the most children to then inherit the land. And, but then she stopped herself and she said, but there's nothing here. So she said, and in my culture, it's not if, we have to say, it's not when, it's if a woman comes in. But she said, there's nothing here, so why would another woman want to have a lot of children? But so I had to meet. So in terms of getting cultural change there, what we have to do is we're setting up the country, not when I say we, the global partnership, but the country is setting up husband schools to teach the husbands first because they're the power structure in a polygamous society about why having fewer children makes sense. And that it is a, it is a decision. The women think there's no decision in this. It's, it's just like if you'd gone to France many, many centuries ago. Where women didn't know there was a decision that they could make about their bodies. So we have to teach the husbands first, get them involved. I met with a whole group of the imam, the whole structure, all the way up in the country of the imams. And they say, yes, the Quran says we can do family planning. And we need to teach that to all the imams in the village. And we need to get them to spread the word. So that's the way in Niger to start cultural change is the husbands and the imams. And then get the women talking and get the contraceptives in and let them make the decision then. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks for the initiative. So, yeah, when you talk about contraceptive, it's more like the pills or the injectables or... Because I read some reports, that there's an association or you know um, correlation between you know maybe increase of breast cancer or some you know some side effects from contraceptive. So you mentioned the father school or that that's awesome because I think one initiative maybe will start from the men you know because women alone definitely cannot do this. Um, and also, maybe some women can, can never accept it, or, or their body won't accept it, or their mental cannot accept it. Uh, so do you have like complementary programs in your initiatives to basically address the part of the population? Yes. So, so one of the myths in contraceptives, one of the, the things that was wrong with the system, is if you asked yourself, are there contraceptive stockouts in the developing world? Country after country would tell you, no, we're stock, we have stocks you know, 80, 90% of the time. We had to dig deeper to find out that actually what they had in stock were condoms. There are lots of condoms. Because of HIV AIDS and, and everything that PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, has done in these countries, there are lots of condoms. But women will tell you over and over again they have no power to negotiate a condom in their relationship. Because they said, if I say, especially African women will tell you, they say, if I say to my husband, I want him to wear a condom, I'm either accusing him of having AIDS or I must have been not been, I've been outside my relationships. I'm saying I'm worried that I have AIDS. So she doesn't have that power. So we need to give her options that she can decide. You need to give, make sure she's got pills. She's got the injectable, but a longer lasting injectable. Eventually one she could give herself. We're working on one that's a little blister pack. An implant, implants are very popular in, place, in many places in the world where you put a few rods in your arm and the implants last five years. We're bringing the prices of those down. Long term, there's even talk, you want to talk about innovation, of a microchip that could be put under a woman's arm. Here in the U.S., uh, in, and actually in Britain, there's a microchip that's being developed to deliver an osteoporosis drug. If that comes to fruition, you could probably also load a contraceptive into it. So, and we have to look at, I mean, and believe me, we are part of studying the side effects of hormonal contraceptives, making sure they're safe for women, making sure countries follow their own policies. Um, but there's a whole range of options if we invest in the right way. So one last, one last question, somewhere in the back, yes. I know you're looking for understanding of your mission. What is your message for people who potentially can help? Understand. Great question and great way to close. Um, your, your message to other people, what would your message be for how they can help you? And you've got a 
good audience of very yeah. uh, capable people here to yeah. tell them how they well, can Well, I would say first, get, get involved. F start to learn. Learn about something you're passionate about and pick your area in philanthropy. It doesn't have to be one of ours. It might be one of ours. And then one of the fantastic things, as you all know even better than I do, about social media these days is you can connect via the web and connect in very meaningful ways. So I would say this. If you have the opportunity to go to the developing world, your eyes will be opened. I, will, I would just at least say in a way that probably you'll never be able to turn away. That's how I felt. That's what got me started, our first trip to Africa, which was a vacation. I couldn't turn away after that. I went to see the animals. I loved it. But it was the people. You, you can't turn your back. So I would say get involved. If you can go to the developing world, do. If you can volunteer in a school here, volunteer in a hospital, start to learn what the problems are. But then connect via the web. Donors Choose is a fantastic website. If you want to give $30 to a classroom, you know, a few dollars to help a teacher buy a printer she needs for a classroom that's in you know, a bad part of, of Oakland where she can't get a laser jet, help her do that. If you want to go up on Catapult and learn about projects in the developing world, microloans for women's, contributing to um, helping buy contraceptives for women or buy a vaccine for somebody, all of those options exist on the web and are very well researched and then placed. We're involved in a whole host of them. One of them is Catapult. We fund donors choose. But there are lots of places you can go on the web if you want to donate money. But there's also donating your time and donating your energy, and I would encourage you to do that too, and do that locally. There's so many things to get involved in. Well, I want to thank you very much. We have a um, presentation. Please join me in thanking Melinda. Um, on behalf of DFJ, the SVP and Basis, we'd like to give you this award. Thank you so much. And thank much. you very much for coming thank here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. you.